Well, I'm going to give it a minute or two for folks to get joined in. And for those on, I'm dropping a link to the agenda into the Zoom chat. If you could put your name in the attendance, that would be awesome. All right, I think I will go ahead and get the ball rolling. This is the December 4th, 2018 SIG release meeting. This is a Kubernetes meeting. Like all the others, it's being recorded. We'll post it to YouTube for posterity shortly afterwards. And we expect everybody to adhere to our code of conduct during the meetings. Um, yeah, so that said, welcome to our bi-monthly meeting. Um, we've got a relatively light agenda in some regards today, but some of the things could, depending on conversations, go quite a ways. I wanted to start with Aish. Um, yes. Release came out yesterday, 113. Out there, good. Anything yeah. that you want to report up or any uh, help or... Nothing, uh, nothing other than just we have to retro tomorrow. That's about it. Uh, so far, I haven't heard any fires or anything from anybody. So I'm thinking things are sticking. So yeah. Retro tomorrow or Thursday? Oh, I'm sorry. Retro, retro okay. on Thursday at 10 a.m. community meeting. I, yeah. I'm going to guess you put in two days worth of work yesterday. So tomorrow, tomorrow counts as Thursday. <laughs> yesterday was pretty smooth from what I was expecting. So. From the outside, or mostly outside, it looked quite smooth as well. So kudos, great job. So I guess that goes in the next thing on the agenda. Just wanted to put a shout out. 113 retrospective coming up on Thursday in the community meeting. Aaron had actually very wisely in Slack, I think earlier today, mentioned that we should also be scrubbing the 112 retro doc to compare if there are things that we definitely did or didn't do and be thinking about rolling things forward or understand where we are because we often write these things down and then move on to the next and life happens. So I've got links to both of those there in the doc. Anything else anybody wants to say on retro or 113? Yeah. Um, do we have a moderator for the retro? Good question. There was a ping on Slack and Jace had responded sort of, huh, what? So yeah, we need to double check that. Uh, I don't consider him confirmed at this point. Wouldn't the community meeting who was running it moderate it or no? Uh, this time we actually scheduled it in the community meeting schedule in advance. So there is not a designated community meeting runner mm -hmm. for this. Event. Okay. Any. Yeah. So I will, I can. Unless Aisha, you want to take it, either you or me, one of us could. could I'm considering I'll have things to talk about. Yeah, I don't let Aisha moderate. No, no, I didn't Never. mean moderate. I meant talk to. Um, so the, the AR is one of us needs to talk to Jace to confirm, otherwise, chase down a Jace alternate. If uh, uh, Jace pings SIG contribx, they're generally the SIG. I just reviewed their charter, and I think that was one of the things they call out is uh, they offer moderation. Okay. Uh, say contrapix. Okay, yes. I can ping there. And uh, if I don't hear back from anybody, Tim, would you be willing to moderate? Worst case or the best case? <laughs> Worst case, I mean, I should be able to. I was 
my I mean, my job for one thirteen really starts today, so I, oh, I can okay. be an outsider. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll report. I'll ping. No, but that, you guys. I think that, that's an option. But we should. I, I think we'll find somebody in Contrabex. Okay, I'll take that action again. I had one other one thirteen related thing. Maybe we can discuss this in retro. Uh, so feel free to put me there. But I'm looking through the release notes, and the top portion of them seems, or sorry, not quite the top portion, but the major themes section is broken out by SIG. And some of them seem really, really fluffy. Uh, for example, SIG Big Data says that it's been focused on community engagements relating to third party project. There have been no impacts on the 113 release. I have no idea why this is in a file called changelog inside of Kubernetes Kubernetes. Another example might be SIG IBM Cloud, where they talk about how they rolled out version 112 of Kubernetes in their IKS service. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel strongly that we shouldn't be talking about commercial offerings in the release notes for a community or open source project. I say this, of course, not having checked to see if there's any specific GKE stuff mentioned here, but if there were, I would kindly ask that we remove that as well. So this is kind of a symptom of the way release notes have evolved to be collected over time, where they're just sort of fanned out to SIGs, and SIGs are kind of reporting in mm -hmm. really, maybe I'm wrong, I was under the impression that this file called changelog for most repositories historically talks about the code changes in that repository. So even though Kubernetes is a project that spans multiple repos, we're not really packaging up all of those multiple repos into this single uh, project. And lest we get too far field and start talking about distros and, and packaging stuff up in there, I just really just to kind of highlight that I'm not sure these release notes are an example I would want the community to follow going forward. Yeah, and I think that's reasonable. I mean, the major theme section was introduced because the project grew to a point, uh, you know, back when we were still collecting all of the release notes only through uh, automated tooling, we were finding that that content was also not useful for individual contributors. And the idea was that SIG leads would be able to produce user relevant content that would go into a change log. But certainly we, I think, I guess you've definitely highlighted one, at the steering committee level, we should be much more stringent about removing kind of vendor specific SIGs. At least that's my, that's my opinion, that we just shouldn't have them. We should collapse them into a, a, a uh, you know, kind of a birds of a feather kind of thing. Like I would love to see SIG IBM Cloud and all SIG insert provider all collapse down into SIG Cloud provider. As, as one part of this problem. Um, the other is, yes, having final review um, over the major theme section so that they're, they're not just fluffy uh, commercial announcements. Uh, we probably need to add a, uh, an actual uh, task in the enhancements leads role that, to do that, or to say that they are responsible for, for doing that and cutting uh, communications which shouldn't go out or maybe make it uh, add a task for the uh, communications role on the release team. But I definitely agree that you've highlighted an important problem to, to address. Yeah, the, the major themes thing is kind of like <laughs> this horrible mutant that grew from my attempts to take a massive list of changes and then distill them down to what seems like anywhere from three to five human manageable themes that I could then hand off to a comms team to go market and blog about. And then the next person decided they couldn't, they couldn't maintain that editorial voice as a human and it was easier to shard all of that work out to SIGs. But then we never, like, we, we mapped, but we never reduced um, the stuff that came back from SIGs. Mm -hmm. So I guess I just kind of wanted to raise it here in the SIG rather than in the retro to get the SIG's sort of stance on what these release notes should be. Yeah, there was also um, quite a bit of discussion when SIG AWS also um, wanted their alpha cloud provider features to be included in the release notes. 
and um, there was some back and forth and then we pointed we decided to point to their release notes within r 113 um, mainly because there was no process around how do we handle um, out of tree providers cloud providers in the whole release itself. Yeah, that probably uh, SIG AWS, how they point to release notes for three of their out of tree projects. Yeah. One of the things that I see within that is this change log, even though it sits in the KK repo, this one in particular starts to read like a distro, like it, uh, th there's something bigger to it. And I, I can imagine that that is a natural outcome as we split the monolith, but somehow it's got to be done right still to where it's like it's the open source stuff and there has to be something there that's still integratable that it's not just references off to commercial offerings that are closed source and that's the only way to make something right yeah and i think we were really lacking in terms of updated guidance from sig architecture as to how one can talk about sub projects um that i'd don't also live say KK. steering so I've been kind of bumping into this a bit on um, in the discussions around support and the working group LTS. There's a couple of things between the architecture, SIG architectures charter and the steering committee also like steering committee there says, decide how and when official releases of Kubernetes artifacts are made and what they include. So changelog I would think falls squarely within that. And then another weird one then, since we're kind of on the, the topic getting input from SIG release, the steering committee charter says declare a release so that the committee can ensure quality feature other requirements are met. Like that's a, that one maybe feels like at this point it has actually been delegated to SIG release. Maybe the doc is behind. <laughs> This, this is hilarious. Um, yeah, I would argue that we, there are a couple there. No, wow, we also apparently control access to uh, the different repos and orgs, which is, so I think it's trying to say we have the final say. Uh, I would imagine the rest of the steering committee would agree with me that we will delegate and defer as much of that judgment to this SIG as is possible. Yeah. Um, and we only would consider ourselves the escalation point of last resort. Yeah, that was my understanding of the steering committee in general. It was supposed to serve the idea of kind of a parent process where all the actual responsibilities, I mean, because someone has to hold the responsibilities legally and right. be the, the link between the CNCF and the rest of the project writ large, since nominally the CNCF is the owner of all of this stuff. But the idea is that the steering committee would delegate all of those enumerated responsibilities to one or more special interest group. But as, as Aaron was saying, as there, there is, needs to be a body of escalation of last resort and it would be the steering committee. I can, I can try raising this during the steering committee meeting tomorrow real quickly. And if it turns into more than a two minute answer, I'm gonna defer it to uh, in-person discussion at the contributor summit. Because we don't necessarily spell out every other technical aspect of this project or its policies that we're delegating. It's kind of unclear to me why we're spelling these out in particular, if only because maybe they sort of define what Kubernetes is. And in that sense, maybe the steering committee has some involvement but I'm sure all of us would rather not be in the critical path for anything because it takes us literally forever to accomplish the barest minimum of work. So that would probably tremendously slow down the release process. I think when it comes to clarifying what a release includes, I'd like to understand whether or not the steering committee thinks they need final sign off on concept of a distribution or whatever word you want to use or if the, it's something that's more of a safe architecture decision in concert with SIG release.
TLDR, I will ask about it tomorrow and we'll probably just talk about it a bunch at the Contributor Summit. Makes sense, yeah. I think that that, what is Kubernetes discussion is potentially one that could take a lot of time face to face. I, I think <laughs> last year in Austin, it was one thing to like be up on the stage and sort of like, hey, kernel versus distribution idea. Let's mm -hmm. talk about it. But it's kind of slowed since then. And if it, if it becomes a topic of face to face discussion, I could see it being a very robust conversation. I wouldn't say it's slowed so much as we've never actually had an honest commitment of resources to fleshing out that concept and implementing it from any of the sundry companies that participate in Kubernetes. Maybe the slowness, like slowed down is probably the wrong way to say it, but like you, big, huge keynote, big, important people packs the room with however many thousand are there almost felt like it was about to start some momentum anyway. and maybe that, like you say, it's just, it's waiting for us to make it happen. Each of us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I tried to capture some of this in the minutes. Okay. Uh, that's helpful. So I'm just going to ask at the retrospective, whether the community agrees with me about that because Maybe there are some edits that are worth making to the release notes, um, but I would rather hear from them as opposed to this group. Yeah, that sounds good. And especially who should be uh, moderating those notes, if it's enhancements or comms lead or... Yeah. We do have a person who's dedicated to doing release notes. I just don't know if this is uh, something that we as a group are aware of. Um, well, I think one of the things like you kind of hinted at that level, that top level editorial voice is hard to find authoritatively in an individual. Like for our release team volunteers, if we like, yeah, if they own it, but do they feel comfortable owning it versus like feeling like it could be a steering level? Oh, that's a whole other thing. I'm not sure I want to blow our discussion that much out of the water, but I've always felt that ever since release notes turned into something that's done by group rather than by a single individual at the end, that that's, that's trouble. Um, I, I would love to see some more invested effort from somebody or a group of people at SIG Architecture who probably have a little more purview over how all of this hooks together and what is more or less meaningful from an architectural perspective uh, to help us kind of, like I said, I feel like we've maybe done the mapping part great. We haven't done the reducing part terribly well. And they might be a good pool of people to pull from there. Makes sense to me. So the next thing that was on the agenda, um, test flake discussion, and whether in December we do something for a bit of a coordinated push to do some cleaning up in the potentially quiet period. Um, Josh and Aaron, you talked about this. I don't know if there's a specific tracking ticket or like, is there gonna be a map reduce -y sort of like pounce Aaron on things? Or I think Aaron filed the deflaking ticket. So no, I haven't filed like one umbrella issue called deflake all the tests, right? Oh, but right. Yeah, no, this was just the event message. Right. What I did was, hey, we identified an anti-pattern. Maybe somebody should go take a look at where that anti-pattern occurs and, and fix it. Um, Yeah, I, I don't. <laughs> so I think there are a number of GitHub issues out there that yeah. probably describe different ways that we could deflake the tests and how the tests are too flaky. And again, this is one of those areas where there's just never been an, an actual commitment of resources to it. I, think yeah, I, I wasn't looking for an umbrella necessarily as like, if I wasn't sure if part of the other day's discussion was like, okay, we're going to decide a couple of these and see if together we could have a few people focus on something concrete. Yeah, there's a, there's a issue opened by six storage, which specifically talks about this for their E2E tests. Um, I linked that in the retro doc. I can put it here if you want. Yeah. 
um, but we don't have an umbrella one, probably we should have one and then point individual six or individual right. cases. Right. That. I, I almost say if we were going to have an umbrella called deflate the test, this would amount to a cap. <laughs> it's that big of an amount of work. Um, the, um, but I mean, frankly, if, you know, over the next quarter, we got the event messaging anti-pattern erased and SIG performance completed deflaking the 5,000 node test, um, then that would be a huge amount of progress from perspective of how flaky the test board is. Um, and then the remaining sort of big area of flakiness would be upgrade downgrade tests. Um, the, um, so, um, ultimately I, I agree. It's a massive amount of work. I don't have the bandwidth to enumerate just how much work that is. I wish somebody would though, so that we could start breaking it up into chunks because, uh, um, Josh has been a great human machine learning unit and has uh, individually felt the pain of tests flaking. And so he has this feeling inside of him that can sort of loosely approximate uh, amount and priority of tests that should be fixed. But ultimately, I think the community would be best served by a dashboard where we could see what is flaking and how much it's flaking and why it's flaking. And we as a community understood that when we made changes, we could see those changes and results reflected in that dashboard. And we do kind of have this information spread around in a couple different places. We have the BigQuery metrics dashboard for Velodrome, for example, which highlights the top uh, flakiest jobs and then the two flakiest issues for those. We also have the triage dashboard, which shows uh, it takes the failure text from each test that fails across every single job and tries to cluster all of those together and then sorts it by which failure texts have happened the most across the past two weeks. Um, but I'm not sure we have, we have yet identified the perfect like leaderboard or whatever. Oh, we also have a graph that shows the daily flakiness of each of the pre-submit jobs. Um, we don't yet have a graph that does the same thing for the release blocking jobs. And I personally have always envisioned something that looks kind of more like uh, a test grid-ish, but more like a, a heat map. So you can see gradations of flakiness uh, over time rather than a bunch of lines. I think that would be really good for us as humans who can do pattern matching visually. Uh, but so I just think there's, there's a lot to do. Uh, identifying and going after events sounds great. Um, I don't know what else we could be doing, but I know there are a number of people who are interested in trying to measure and, and show uh, project health in general and where we can improve it. I, I think like test coverage would be another great thing. Uh, we have unit tests and they do generate coverage somehow, but we don't actually, can anybody tell me what our test coverage is? I feel like you're the authoritative person from your conform conformance. Looking I, dude, I, can't, I can't even tell you what our test coverage is. I can tell you what the conformance tests hit end to end, kind of, sort of, but not really. Oh, that's true. You said unit. That's a different, yeah. yeah. The, the conformance luck coverage versus deliberate unit, big difference, yeah. Uh, anyway. So, so, I mean, I appreciate the, the big picture discussion on how we shine a light on the general problem, but like... I'm interested in the flakes. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Oh, um, go ahead, go, go. I'm interested in the flakes part specifically for this release in trying to continue the stake we put in the ground with release blocking criteria. Flakiness was one of those criteria. And I want us to be able to measure that criteria. We still, I think we're going to talk about that leaderboard or whatever, we still kind of lack that for the release blocking jobs to see that yes, they run this frequently, cool, that's green. They take this long, cool, that's green. They are this flaky, oh no, that's red. Let's figure out what we can do to make that green. Like at a, at a minimum, I want to quantify flakiness at a release blocking job level. 
but I think when Josh starts talking about flake reduction and test flakes in general, that starts to make me think of all the test cases rather than just the jobs. Yeah, it would also be interesting, I guess, for the release blocking tests, perhaps for the person uh, who ultimately picks up this work, maybe turning off the num retries option in Ginkgo for so the release we, blocking tests. We actually have a job that does that, but the last time I looked, the job is timing out. But uh, we do- Shocking. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but that is that is something I will try and adjust the timeout if I can find it that we do want to get data on was to see whether or not the num retry attempts is actually hiding flakes from us. And if so, you know, maybe we can have a number of jobs that are intended to fail to just uncover flaky things like the events thing doesn't actually really uncover itself until it's run with a whole bunch of other super flaky tests. Like, we also kind of lack the process to prove that if we do tag a test as flaky and then kick it out of the main thing, how do we actually know that we have deflaked that test? Can you show me a run where it runs with the same uh, concurrent tests executing all around of it? You can't, because once we shard something as flaky, we only run it with other flaky tests. We never simulate the conditions that reproduce the failure. So there's, there's a lot we can do here. Yeah, I was going to say, um... I, I don't have specific data to back this up, but my feeling from watching the boards is we have a confluence of individual tests that are flaky and then jobs that are flaky, if you follow me. That is jobs that produce conditions that tend to make tests flake in those jobs that don't flake otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's event messaging or whether it's some other issue. The, um, so... Um, I think if we were to get sort of new boards to to track deflaking, which I think is a terrific idea, um, that um, we would need to look at it from both of those angles. So, you know, flakiest jobs, flakiest tests as two separate um, lists. Yep. The, um, so, yeah. Um, do you have bandwidth to work on that at all, Josh? Um, I will starting in January. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Same here. Well, I mean, look, next week is KubeCon. No, no, I, I completely, I get it. Right? So. Like, it's, it is the same. So, uh, all right. Yes, and that, that was yes. what I was going to say earlier. <laughs> The this has kind of come up, and the reason I wanted to put it on the agenda was like, okay, it's December, and the last conversation had been, well, maybe in December there's actually a bit of a lull where a few targeted things could be done, like not to solve the problem, or some of the like, not going to solve upgrade downgrade tests or probably even event passing, but like for me, I have a little bit of downtime in December where things are quieter, and if there were some targeted things that people wanted to start looking at, what would be the priority list? For me, putting together that dashboard is I, what I will try and invest some time in. Uh, I, I would agree. My priority list would be A, doing the dashboard, and B, trying to get enough people sort of marshaled together to make a decision about what the way forward and upgrade downgrade test is. And, and the alternatives here are trying to fix the existing jobs versus replacing them with new jobs um, that are sort of created from scratch rather than inherited because the existing jobs do not have good ownership. That's going to be a fun contributor summit conversation. Yeah. Um, but it's just, you know, for the existing jobs, when they fail and the failure appears to be associated with the job and not with somebody's individual test, there is zero traction on getting anybody to even look at that. I, I agree. So, um, the, um, but yeah, I mean, so that would be honestly the other big thing because that is like step one or step zero in looking at, hey, let's deflake the upgrade downgrade tests. Let's first say, okay, what kind of upgrade downgrade tests are we going to have? 
because it's certainly not at all clear to me that the test that we do have is the test that we want to have. So on that front, maybe a uh, Aaron question. 114 is the cluster subdirectory of KK going away? I have no idea. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be focused on the jobs as they exist today. Uh, you know, I, I look forward to having a bunch of discussions about the stuff at the Contributor Summit and see yeah. where, where we go from there. Yeah, I know that Tim St. Clair has some large ideas, I think, but I haven't heard details and I'm interested to ask that question. He does. There. I mean, the, the, conservative, the conservative in me is going to plan the upcoming release based on what I have today. And so that's the right way to do yeah. the things that are here today. And I'm going to continue to, uh, I think another piece of low hanging fruit might be uh, completing the work of adding a release, release master informing dashboard. Uh, and moving the appropriate jobs there. Uh, there's an issue for this in case sig release. Uh, anyway, uh, it's like I only ever got as far as moving the GKE jobs off, but I think there were a number of other jobs that we kind of agree don't belong on master blocking. Yeah. Or could perform the scale, 5,000 5, scale job. Um, even if it catches legitimate failures, like it just doesn't run frequently enough for us to pay as much attention to. Um, and then maybe some of the serial jobs could also get moved over there. Josh, I remember you opening an issue with the list of um, those jobs. I'm trying to find it, but there was one more that you opened today. Um, do, you want to, do you want me to link this one to the old one or? Wait, link what thing? So there's a bunch of different things open. Um, the thing I just opened today is to the left for me. Oh, right. You yeah. opened that. Um, release tests yeah. into blocking and forming extra. Mm -hmm. um, You're going to have to describe to me why extra. Well, read, read the thing. One of the questions in the discussion issue is, should we even have an extra? No. Um, so the, um, um, so please voice that opinion in a comment. Um, um, Okay, I guess it would have been clearer for me to understand this if it had been a, a PR to the uh, to the doc that described our release blocking dashboards. But yeah, I'll take a look at this. Um, but there was oh yeah, three four seven. Three four seven is the issue I had in mind. It's like uh, this is the umbrella issue to uh, follow up. Yeah, I'm looking for another one that Josh opened with a list of things that we should move to informing. I'll find that and probably. Um, link that here. Uh, I linked it. I linked it to three forty six. So, okay. this reminds me of a question I've had on the five thousand node. Since you mentioned that, Aaron, on the scale testing, is there like a architectural or philosophical level? desire to have those run serially or is it just like is it resources if we threw money at the problem could we get more runs or is there a desire to not have three 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 day tests running in parallel with one starting and stopping each day it is definitely resources um yeah, we only have two environments at google dedicated to this uh because it's spending um and it's shared not just with the open source team, but also internal product development teams who also need access to a high scale environment. None of that, to the best of my knowledge, has moved over 
uh, to this to a CNCF managed project that we could properly uh, allow to spin up that much res that many resources all at once. Yeah, no, like that. I don't. I know we're we're nowhere near even talking about what jobs will or won't be funded by the money that Google donated to the CNCF, so the project can run itself with the plethora of non Google engineers who will surely show up to implement this. Um, well, that's probably why I asked, because I want to be able to start understanding if or when can I bring staff resources and dollar resources to that. Uh, so staff resources should be showing up to the Kate's Infra working group meeting. Uh, we're trying to move slowly and methodically migrating over DNS first and then looking at things that will assist the uh, openness of the release process. So I think that's the GCR in Google Cloud buckets or storage buckets. Um, and there are a couple other utility clusters that we're looking at. We still don't have a uh, process in place to decide all of the meta around managing clusters, users, uh, all, that, all that fun stuff. Um, and when we think we have all of that in place, we can start talking about uh, kicking over things like Prowl and whatnot. Uh, but that said, if you have 5,000 spare machines lying around in a cloud today, we can certainly set up a Prowl job to talk to those 5,000 machines with our current Prowl instance. Because really, a lot of the spend comes from where the clusters are running not from actually running the infrastructure. And so that's where I'm talking about, like in the eventual future where we migrate jobs over, the question is like, how, many, how much money is going to be spent for jobs that are just obvious common sense reference implementation project things versus jobs that are testing out cloud provider specific things. So in the world where we're verifying that a 5,000 node cluster meets its SLIs and SLOs. In the world of scalability, that can often depend upon how the cluster is set up and the specifics of the environment. So I would imagine Google might pay Google's money to make sure that that is valid in Google's cloud and Amazon would probably pay Amazon's money to make sure that's valid in Amazon's cloud. And where, where we're at today, either in terms of money or physical resources. We just don't have the room to do anything more than serial runs of these 5,000 node clusters okay. and environments that they're, they're in. It was this, yeah, that's why we had to put together this crazy like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday scheduling for all of them. That makes sense. So you mentioned Kate's Infra Working Group. Is that like a formal entity? It will be as soon as I finish the working group draft uh, uh, charter. Okay. okay. Thing for being too sig like. Uh, we do have regular uh, meetings. The channel in Slack right now is called Kate's in for Team. Um, and you can show up there and ask questions, and people will point you in the right direction. I plan on getting all the things renamed to WG Kate's in for once uh, we get the, the charter ratified, which I hope to have accomplished by the end of the year. Cool. That's good. And I wasn't aware of where the details of that were. So that was, thank you. Um, anything else on test flakes then? Got one more thing that I do want to try to get to on the agenda. Okay, moving on then. Um, shadow selection process. I think Josh, you're the main one here. Stephen Augustus had some stuff come up today, so he couldn't join, but is there, I just wanted to do a status check. Is there anything else we need to do versus ungating leads to go ahead? So uh, we should go ahead. So um, there is one thing that's incomplete about this and we need to decide how we're gonna deal with that. Um, or we want the team relief to decide how they're going to deal with it. Um, so, uh, Stephen Augustus somewhat justifiably said it's going to be really confusing to have um, set up different forms for every different role. Um, and um, I mean, I was thinking of more as email templates, which would have been less of a problem, but whatever. 
uh, Stephen Augustus wanted to have sort of one generic form and to have the exact sort of shadow requirements documented in the role handbook for each one. And that are, there's a lot to be said for that approach. Um, the drawback to the approach for 114 is that the shadow requirements are not documented in each role handbook right now. Um, so if we can go ahead with Stephen's questionnaire, which is generic, and refers to the requirements in the role handbook, which may or may not exist, um, how do we want to handle it for 114? Obviously, for 115 going forward, we can make sure that the role handbooks are all caught up with the requirements section. It's just that that's not necessarily going to get done in the next five or six days. Aaron, do you have any concerns with just pragmatically going forward having leads have a simple conversation about what the requirements are? Or does it need to be more formal than that? I sure hope not, because that's what I've been doing. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, I think right now we don't even have that conversation, right? So even having that would be a good first step. I agree making sure that leads understand as a part of their job to reach out to prospective shadows and have a conversation to kind of level set. Here's what would be expected. Can, does that sound scary or exciting? Can you commit to it or oh, better wait till another time span when I can like that, that just one-on-one -on -one between the, the lead and the prospective shadow, I think would be really beneficial to be doing now. Yeah, and also some um, basic kind of maybe outline having uh, them being distributed kind of might help too. So some basic guidelines like that. Um, yeah, for the leads. And I am breaking tradition here. I'm looking to have, I already have uh, Ben Elder as a release lead shadow. I'm looking to have another non-Googler as a release lead shadow in the interest of diversity. And I've been approached by a couple of people. I've held off on having that conversation with them because I kind of need to figure out what those responsibilities are that I'm looking out of or looking, looking for from them. Oh God, I can't use words anymore. Uh, anyway, the hardest part of every language. <laughs> uh, so I got a lot of reading to do and I will, I, I did plan to have a good bunch of conversations at the contributors on that. One thing we talked about doing that Ben didn't, as far as I know, really do during the 113 cycle was to give the release lead shadow as one of their duties, um, checking up on all of the individual role, role shadows to be like, you know, are you involved? Are you getting mentoring, et cetera? Yeah. Um, that didn't happen in one. One when I was the shadow in one twelve. No. I did not. If that was my duty during one thirteen, I failed miserably. I that. failed in one twelve too. <laughs> yeah. so. Wait, it's something we've talked about but never done. Yeah. So okay. um, and particularly if you're talking about potentially having two release lead shadows, then that seems like a really good time to make that a practice. I will give it a look. Oh my God, this doc is so long. <laughs> <laughs> Are you looking at the role handbook? <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I am. The release and lead handbook? Okay. Yes, I am. There's, there's a, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, by the way, Tim, the release lead uh, handbook does not have the 112 release theme. You are falling down on the job there. Oh. <laughs> Well, I put in like the one for 1.8 or something, even if I missed the one for 112. I did, I put something in there. That's true. Um, now, I think I, personally, I'm approaching it from the perspective of my, my main concern with being early team lead at all is I tend to get uh, yanked into a bunch of different things. So I want to make sure I've got some easily delegatable stuff that the shadows can pick up in the event that I disappear. Makes sense to me. So at this point, should we like, do we need to do anything formal here? Aaron, do you just want to tell your leads like go forth and 
make sure you talk to your people, pick people, just move forward? Yes. Okay. We were still going to send out the survey or no? I thought Stephen was going to do that. And then based on the responses, the leads would at least know who to talk to. Is that right or no? Am I seeing head nodding from Josh? Josh nodding head? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, even, like I said, even if the current process is incomplete, it's better than no process, which is what we had before. Okay. So we should go ahead with it because we're out of time to tinker with it for this cycle. Some of these shadows might, might be in KubeCon too, so good time for in-person sync as well. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so who's doing that on the send out the survey? I thought Stephen was going to do that from okay. his update in the burn down yesterday. Okay, I will just make sure that I wanted to make sure in the notes and then ping him on it. We can touch on this again during the retro. Okay. Okay, the, the last thing on the agenda was just that we chairs of the SIG need to be looking at that SIG release issue 378 and nibbling away at it. And I think I'll just leave that at that. Um, anything anybody else wants to talk about today? Um, so, Again, maybe it's uh, retro fodder, but loosely speaking, one of the things I want to see happen in the 114 release cycle is more formalism introduced uh, when it comes to promoting a feature from alpha to beta, beta to stable. I believe that formalism comes from more architectural oversight and a documented list of requirements that is written in such a way that it can be used as a checklist. And I think that uh, CAPS are a, the mechanism by which all of this should be driven. I'm really kind of unclear on the details of how all of that should get implemented though. Um, I'm just asking maybe for some feedback or opinions here with the time we have left since I've got you know, an enhancements lead here. I've got somebody who's been working on CAPS pretty extensively, and I've got two former release leads here. How would you I, all envision this process going? I kind of envision it, at least uh, while well, I've been playing around with it in the back of my head, um, it would mirror how we would want to have, so I would imagine we'd have a, uh, a section of a CAP that is uh, where you have the, I mean, like you have today, uh, Kind of like developer focused documentation where that goes into the api design for an enhancement i would like to add to the kep tool uh, a command that would uh, create a pull request against like a api review or architectural tracking repository that would give a pointer to the cap for people in sig architecture to review and move also the enhancements process to rather than, I mean, over time. Uh, well, it, it, move enhancements tracking uh, similarly uh, to a pull request based system rather than an issue based system. So we don't have to, after the end of the release, try and scrape the issues and see what actually went into the release or not. So I'm imagining that the, the architectural review and the enhancements tracking for a single release would be a more or less the same process, just in two different repositories. Okay. But that's just kind of the thought, I, the ideas I've had kicking around in my head. And that you would get a, uh, so before a cap was like implementable, ideally, uh, you would have someone from SIG Architecture give the stamp of approval mm -hmm. before, you move, before you move forward. Any other comments? Also, from my experience at least, what should be the set of questions or the checklist that should be there? Maybe what's the conformance um, coverage or uh, not coverage, but should the conformance test pass? Should we have separate profiles? And also, if there's any known issues, 
are those known issues kind of acceptable and who kind of makes a call on that? What would be um, uh, some kind of oversight and uh, vetting to say, okay, this, this uh, enhancement with this set of known issues is okay to go to beta or GA. Um, so right now, I don't know who makes the final call on that if we rely on the SIG to do it or in cases where um, the release team still feels, okay, it's not okay to go, even though SIG gives a stamp on it, then should we escalate it to SIG ARC? What should be the process around that? Is, isn't there something in the cap about who the like owner is or something? Uh... Yeah, there, there's approvers and reviewers field. But that also would be confined to that SIG, right, versus? Yeah, I'm just pulling a random one out of the hat. There's a SIG instrumentation kept here. It's a metrics overhaul. And the two approvers that are listed are, to my knowledge, both in SIG instrumentation. So, so you could have the idea of an uh, API approver or something. I mean, we have to, like, that, that process, the API review process kind of died on the vine before we could roll out a new iteration of it. Because it was like Phil's project and then Phil went on paternity leave and it became Brian's project and then Brian went on vacation and a bunch of other stuff to do. Yeah, I felt so, like Jace rolled, rolled a process through SIG architecture. There was a document, there was much discussion. We label PRs with API review or API change, but I don't know what else happens. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like. My, my personal feeling is we're lacking uh, an assigned person to do oversight on these things. And I think that it is uh, unfair to expect the release lead to have the time, capacity, and technical depth to make a judgment call on each and every single one of these caps. I also think is probably unfair to expect that of the enhancements lead. I mean, Kendrick, how, how were you kind of getting a feel for whether or not these things were headed in the right direction or not? Sorry, Kenny, not Kendrick. You know what I mean. <laughs> it's all right, I'm here again. Sorry, say the question again. Like, how, um, you know, how were you keeping track of or getting a gut check that, yeah, these caps were we're generally on track or headed in the right direction or, or not. So Keps, I honestly, I wasn't paying too much attention to the Keps in this whole thing because what I was doing is I was looking at the tracking issue with inside of the, the enhancement repo. And then I would see the, the KKPR that's, that's associated with it. And mm -hmm. that's where I'm sitting there making sure that it's actually having some sort of progress during this whole time. If it, if there was, you know, no comments or no tests being ran or anything like that. That's when sort of the, the flags were being raised that, okay, is this going to happen? Is this going to make it across the finish line or not? Okay. Yeah, I think Aaron, um, mostly the release team, at least for 113, we were tracking the progress versus, but not, not at least at last minute, seeing if they were doing, if they were designed or, or ready to, to either graduate. So that checklist was something that uh, the release team was missing or we needed somebody to give that stamp of approval. Okay. Yeah, it feels like there's, a, there's an auditor or something that is missing from these uh, caps. Uh, and unfortunately my gut tells me if I were to try and make push all of that onto SIG architecture, I might find a fair amount of bottlenecks. Um, okay. But I think like maybe well, the, we are seeing the signs of that though. Like, so going back to, um, oh, what was it? Um, storage snapshots that was going on, I think in my cycle and the, from a kept perspective or from the SIGs perspective, a whole bunch had happened. Everybody finally aligned and was was cool and happy with stuff. And then when it hit architecture level, there was a big whoa. Wait a second. And at that point, code like, at the SIG level, they decided what they were doing. They had 
we're rapidly going towards implementation. Now back over in SIG release, we're on the release team specifically, not SIG release. On the release team, we were looking, like Kenny said, at the PRs and issues. And from that perspective, as a, a window into the SIG, what they had decided, things look coherent and on track. Mm -hmm. But then project oversight wise, there was a disconnect there. So I do think that that needs to happen somehow earlier and have some criteria there that then maps to us in the release team being able to just kind of say like, okay, you, you've committed all of this stuff, but is your, show me your, remind me where your tests are, where your docs are, the, the basics that we ask for, that it's not, I don't want to say a surprise, but I feel like we are sort of the surprising gate holder sometimes right. on the release team. And then we don't, when they say, well, why? And is that consistent with, the, they didn't have to do that. We, we don't have a, a list to point at. I mean, ultimately what I'm trying to drive to here is, you know, is the next release the one to say, uh, you have to have a cap. If there's no cap associated with this thing you're trying to push in, I'm not sure your code should land. I know that's going to run into the friction of like bug fixes and random features that are too small for a cap. I get that. And it might encourage some people to even slime their way in rather than go through this much larger process. But, but those aren't the things that Kenny or the enhancement lead tracks, right? I mean, yeah. It's bigger picture and, stuff. And I would say no uh, to your question, Aaron, not for this release. Okay. At least because at least until we are in a better place with caps themselves, the, the idea of caps are, they should span one or more releases. We have not yet uh, provided guidance on to how that mapping occurs. I think we should get that guidance done through the 114 cycle. Um, sorry, 115 cycle? No, 115. Uh, yeah. And then we should have introduced a requirement, uh, enhanced requirements for 115. I don't. I, I. I. still think there's room for a generic enhance a, a generic single release enhancement, um, and I don't want to lose that ability if we if we uh, by by moving by for by mandating that uh, uh, enhancements that are tracked must uh, must have a cap. I think there's a lot we can do in terms of making uh, like you were in, the, in realizing suggestions you uh, were making with respect to. Uh, finding uh, enhanced owners and making it easier to manage caps themselves. Right. And to move more work uh, towards caps. I think that, you know, as a large organization, certainly we can help push contributions from our end to that direction. Right. But I don't think we're at a place where we're, we're at the, as a project able to say that you have to use this mechanism yet. I think Brian is more bullish uh, than, or more, that's, yeah. That's, that's, I think that's fair. It could be that I'm trying to use the word cap as a proxy for, I need a document. I need to see like a design document. I need to see a test plan. I need to see this and that. And I guess tracking issues are kind of the place for that information right now, but I don't feel it is sufficient. And the way I would deal with the fact that a lot of enhancement issues don't have caps associated with them is I'd say, go right, run work right now. Like that's it. You got to do it. Um, but okay, uh, I've blown us kind of to our meeting time and I really do appreciate the feedback. Like I said, this is, this is I, doing in I my head. I would love to see, like, if you, if your initial response in the first couple of weeks of the cycle is, oh, your enhancement doesn't have a cap, can you go please write one now? That'd be huge. And yeah. it, it's not like a binding requirement, but maybe everybody does it. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is a shame. I think one of my contributor summit sessions overlaps with the session on caps. Uh, I'll figure it out. <laughs> um, anyway, this point is the first in the retro. I mean, in what we could change. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure it'll come up during the retro. I just like, I, yeah. Yeah, good audience here. Yeah. Good discussion. Thanks everybody. Um, I'll post this to YouTube later and um, have a great day. Thanks all.